Now, what I'd like you to do first, if, if uh, I could ask you, is to give me your name and tell me what your, what you were, what your position was back, back in 1947. I see. My name is D. N. Call, and I belong to the State Police Service. And in 1947, I was an assistant superintendent of police posted in the Serenagar city. I had joined the police force in 1943 after completing my education as a result of competitive examination. So my, that was my first posting in the Serenagar city when the raids came in October 1947. How did you first how, how did you first hear about those raids? About the raid? Well, uh, it's very difficult to trace out a particular source, but somehow the whole city was agog uh, with rumours that the raiders have invaded Kashmir and uh, they want to capture it by force. Some people started running away, some people got panicky, but most people, the generality of the people of the Srinagar city were unaware of what was happening. And as I was mentioning, uh, even some marriages, house in some certain houses where marriages were going on, I found that dancing and singing was continuing unabated and <laughs> without the people knowing actually what was happening. And I remember some people from Baramula side and others coming in tongas and horse carriages giving horrible descriptions of what is happening there uh, uh, in Baramula and elsewhere where the raiders have been have infested those places. When did you first hear about the raids? Uh, I wouldn't be able to pinpoint the date, but uh, somewhere in the in the in the in the last week of October, somewhere sec twenty second twenty third of October, we heard that uh, some raiders have come uh, via Muzaffarabad and uh, they have invaded the city and they are just rushing uh, towards the Srinagar city and they have panned out towards the jungles. You know, it's all foresty area there, uh, Mohora and uh, the Udi area. Uri area that they have fanned out there and they are uh, their target, ultimate target is Srinagar city. So that we came here and later on uh, as the Maharaja was uh, conducting his uh, Dashera Darbar where all gazetted officers are supposed to offer him a sovereign or half a sovereign depending upon their status to show his allegiance to the, to the Maharaja and I was also one of, the, one of the crowd. So as soon as we emerged out of the Darbar Hall, the lights went off. I said, hello, what has happened? And somebody said, well, why are you surprised? Probably the raiders have captured the Mohra power station, which was a damn fact. They had captured the power station, which is about, uh, say, 60 miles from Srinagar. And therefore, uh, the whole city was plunged in darkness. What were people saying about the Maharaja at that time? The people were not happy with the Maharaja at all. He was never popular in that sense, you see. And uh, later on, uh, when he ran away uh, uh, from the Srinagar city uh, at night, you see, he left for Jammu. And uh, at that time also the people said that, listen, if he has been ruling over us all these years, don't you think that in this um, moment of crisis, he should have seated with us here? And if he was really a patriot, he should have died fighting in the streets of Srinagar. Why did he run away to save his own kingdom and his own self, you see? But you were saying that some of the Maharaja's state forces were helping the raiders. Can you tell me that again? They were not helping precisely. You see, what we heard was that one of the battalions of the Dogra forces, the Maharaja's uh, army, uh, was located in Muzaffarabad. Just to, that is that being the state's boundary with the British, then British India. So that battalion was located there and its commanding officer was one Narayan Singh, a very brave soldier who had fought in the Burma war and all that kind of thing. Now, his battalion, battalion normally uh, uh, consists of three to four companies. So half of them were uh, Muslims, you see, because uh, a good chunk of the Muslim Martial uh, class in Kashmir hailed from Jammu area, this Mirpur and all that. Now, presently, Azad Kashmir. They are more martial than the Kashmiris because Kashmiris were not generally uh, employed in the army uh, in the Dora rule. The Kashmiris were denied army. So, those people were there. Now, naturally, their allegiance, their affinity was more with the uh, people of frontier more with the people of Rabalpindi than with the Kashmiris because their language is altogether different. They speak that Pahadi language, Punjabi language, even Muzaffarabad, they don't speak Kashmiri at all. They are actually racially different people. So when this Narayan Singh and his troops were located there, 
we used to hear vague reports that uh, the muslim element uh, of his uh, troops are mixed up uh, have been going off and on to rawalpindi on the casual leave this pretext that pretext and to give imparting all information about the location of troops to those people who were busy organizing these tribesmen there you see and although some of the customs officials there were sending reports to their own higher officers in Srinagar the IG customs and others that listen this is what we hear is happening but somehow as i said call it incompetence call it indifference nobody bothered to see what exactly is happening till the crisis overtook them how did you find out how the raiders were advancing what how was the information reaching you and other people in the police force and we were not getting regular there was no regular information channel at all you see our the, the police information you see the police radio and all thing didn't exist then you see these are all later developments that every police station has a mm, uh, radio set and they keep in constant uh, communication that didn't exist at all only the telegraph and a rickety telephone line was the only thing available you see and vague reports were coming in that uh, these tribes men have come they have fanned out towards uh, 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 the foresty areas you know overlooking udi and uh, mohura power house and all that kind of now uh, i'll you'll be surprised to know the when the first after the maharaja had signed accession and all that on the 26th of october that you must be knowing and uh, because when he uh, found that uh, he was in very deep waters he appealed to the government of india he said what do i do come to my defense they said we can defend you only if you accede to us so he signed the instrument of accession mr vp manan came and uh, then they were that was a defense given for uh, for the maharaja's departure from srinagar that he had to sign the instrument of accession otherwise if he had continued there and if the raiders had caught hold of him they might have forced him to sign an accession to pakistan but where did he sign in srinagar or no, in jammu in jammu so signed in jammu and uh, he he went there i think it was signed on the 26th or 27th of october now as soon as the first indian contingent of troops flew into srinagar those were, the dakota was the only plane there they requisitioned all the indian national airline you know private airline their planes were requisitioned and those in those planes the the troops i remember the first troops to land were patiala light infantry tall patiala 6 you know patiala the city it in uh, punjab now it's a district of punjab now patiala light infantry it was called so they came and and they were uh, the one of their commanding officers were uh, lieutenant colonel somnath sharma he met me at the airport he said hello uh, can you give me any intelligence about the raiders i said i have no particular intelligence but uh, uh, the reports as they trickle in through people and through other various sources that they have fanned out uh, in the in the ud sector and all that kind of oh i will be able to tackle them and like a rash man you see he sat on a jeep went with some of them and when he was half way to baramla was shot at by the raiders he was shot dead now then the raiders is chief aim was to capture the srinagar airfield that was at rambagh where where was that airfield in those days where it is now same airstrip yes yeah only it has been extended since then same place that is called damodar uh, damodar uh, table land damodar wooder in kashmiri the, the the airport was there of course it was small then it didn't have such a big runway and all that kind of thing these boeings etc couldn't have landed there at all so the raiders his attempt was to to capture the airfield so that the indian troops wouldn't be able to come you see what did you hear about what the raiders did in baramola we heard that uh, you see i was in touch with my colleague mr thakur sp baramola and he used A- sp means superintendent of police sp superintendent of police is a short form just as asp means assistant superintendent of police so he used to tell us that well i i get reports he had only a small sitting of a police station that these people are uh, looting houses and they are going into the houses of six and pandits they shot dead some kashmiri pandits they shot dead some muslims and uh, kept on you know people uh, have those brass cups in kashmir they used to use and they, they these raiders were so backward that they thought that this was gold that is what we were told that they were capturing those ordinary drinking tea cups thinking that it is gold and all they were dressed in a green shirt a uh, white shalwar uh, and 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 a kind of a vague belt here and uh, bare headed with beards and carrying a 303 rifle that's all that they had and 
uh, I remember very vividly when two of these raiders have, were captured uh, in Baramula and brought in handcuffs to Srinagar. So lots of people gathered there, two, three hundred in that Lal Chowk. And uh, they were mounted on top of, a, uh, of the roof uh, of a truck. And somebody questioned them, why did you, uh, why did you have the bravado and uh, the cuts to come here? He said, no, we were told that uh, the territory is ours, the loot is yours. We, in, 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 uh, more or less in, in Urdu, he said, hum karne ke. we have come to conquer this territory. We were told you conquer the territory. The loot, whatever you gain, loot is yours, valuables, but we are interested in the territory part of it. Conquer for whom? Pardon? Conquered for, uh, for Pakistan, naturally, who had sent them here that uh, 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 Qayyum Khan and others, uh, they were briefed there by, they say that some Pakistani army officers also in civil trust were mixed up with them. It is possible. What happened, as far as you know, at the Baramullah convent and hospital? Well, Baramullah, we heard a very grisly story of... Uh, how they shot at those nuns and ransacked the whole place. I wouldn't know the, the greater detail, but uh, the overall uh, report which we got was the general report that uh, they shot, uh, shot them dead. Some were manhandled, uh, uh, those women, and uh, indecently handled, and uh, uh, the whole place was ransacked. And uh, uh, that's about all, you see, we heard about the convent. There was a plane going uh, overhead yeah, yeah, just then. Let me ask you again. Can you tell that? What did, what did you know about what happened at the convent and, see, the, and the hospital? You see, my, my information is not first-hand. It's, it's a hearsay account. But what we heard was that uh, these people walked into the convent and uh, manhandled uh, or mishandled uh, uh, those uh, women there, the, the, the sisters and the, the mother superior and everybody, and shot dead some of those uh, uh, women there in that convent. They were doing such valuable missionary work there. And uh, uh, then, they, then they marched on. You see, if these people had not busied themselves in Baramula in these extraneous activities, you see, after all, what had the convent to do with them? They should have marched ahead to capture Sirinagar, but they got busy with the convent. So that, call it uh, providential or call it what you will, you see, by the time the Indian troops reached the outskirts of Srinagar, they had not managed to reach Srinagar, these raiders. Otherwise, if they had, we, we had it. If they had captured the airfield, what would you do? You mean, if the raiders had not delayed at Baramullah and precisely. gone for the airfield, then Pakistan would have captured oh, Kashmir? You know, without doubt it would have. Without doubt, that was the strategy. That was the strategy. Now, you I remember uh, deputing a police officer and some police contingent uh, to ensure the safety of the airport because we were short of resources then. We didn't have many resources. So what little police we could muster, we told them you go and uh, see that uh, nobody comes to sabotage the airport. Or so you were then the assistant superintendent of police. I was the police in the city, yes. You were, you were the assistant superintendent of police in Srinagar. That's correct. And you must have had a very real fear that Kashmir was going to be taken by Pakistan. Of course, I had a fear. I mean, uh, if I may strike a personal note, I remember my late wife and my mother in my house. They told me, listen, you are leaving in the morning and coming back at night, and we are secured. Anything can happen to us. Will you leave one revolver here? Because uh, in case anything bad happens or somebody comes to invade, at least we can shoot ourselves dead. I remember this very vividly. I tried to console them. I said, don't worry, it won't come to that. I am here. I have to perform a spurt of duty. I've got to be morning till evening. But please, there is nothing to fear and no revolver is needed here. You will run amok for nothing. And just to, I used to give them a kind of an encouragement, <laughs> although internally I had my own fears. He said, you never know. After all, if the people come in, then what do you do? Let me just wait for this to... Sona Bhai, Those are very trying times, very trying times, very trying times. So, let me ask you, you mentioned that the raiders looted. Yeah. There are suggestions that they also raped women as they moved. Yes, yes, they raped women because uh, I remember... Uh, Later on, after the raiders had been cleared, a new police party was sent uh, to Baramula, you know, to 
sort of restore order there. And those people told me that some of the women, you know, there were certain red light areas in Baramula, and those women had related to those police officers that these people were sexual maniacs, and they were very ruthless with us. They, those women mentioned it. It's on the basis of that that I am asserting this. You see, they got, uh, they thought it was a free for all. You see, after all, the tribesmen they are. Terribly backward people without any sophistication, without any training, without any education, living a wild life in the wilds of Peshawar and uh, the tribal areas, you see. So uh, you could expect anything, anything inhuman, subhuman from them. Again, we had a problem with the plane. Can I ask you that question again? Please. Do you think there were incidents of rape by the tribal raiders? Uh, yeah, of course there were. Yes. Yes, there were. I mean, only the person in Baramul, uh, of course, this, because they never entered Srinagar, so I wouldn't be able to say about that. But in Baramula, we heard from the local police officers and others later on that they had misbehaved with uh, women and uh, raped and uh, visited the red light areas and things of that sort. Yes. I'm surprised that Baramula had a red light area. Yes, it had. It was uh, demarcated as a red light area, you see, because I have remained subsequently Supreme Police of Baramula a number of times. But uh, we knew that there are certain women who are sort of practicing uh, prostitution uh, in their houses and people are visiting them. One strange thing about the, the, the attack on the convent, I, I've looked at a list of all the people who were, took refuge in the convent. And according to the list, there's one Koshalia, a dancing girl from Bombay, who seems to have been working in Baramulla as a prostitute. Would there have been a regular procession of women from Bombay who came to... Kashmir for that purpose? No, not to my knowledge. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. From what you know... You mean they were practicing prostitution with the tourists and others? No, no, no. no. I will. Were there incidents of sexual violence at the convent as well, as far as you know? I think so, yes. 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 That's what we heard. As I said, this is a hearsay account, and I cannot vouch for <laughs> the truthfulness of these reports. But that is what we heard from my colleague, Mr. Thakur, and other police officers who later on came to see us. We also went to Baramula then to see what, was, what had happened. So there were reports of that type. When did you personally go to Baramula? Did you go yourself shortly after the raid? I, I, I uh, the, the, long after the raid, maybe it had been November, December, you see. Because it didn't fall in my jurisdiction. Fall in my jurisdiction. But even then, what was the situation like in Baramula when you went there? At that time, uh, kind of peace had been restored, you see, then these people had been chased out, you see. Then, you see, when the Indian troops started advancing, uh, I, I wonder if you have re uh, read a book by uh, Lieutenant General Sain that is called Cylinder Was a Threat. Have you read that? And that gives a graphic description. Now, when these people had been chucked out, then regular Pakistani troops came to Udi. Regular Pakistan troops came to Uri because Pakistan said that this Indian army are now advancing and they will now capture even the so-called Azad Kashmir area. So regular Pakistani troops came. At that time, uh, that's what I heard, that Clement Attlee, who was the Prime Minister, he rang up Nehru, he said, listen, the, I don't want India and Pakistan to fight a war. There are regular Pakistani troops there. And if you Indian army continues to advance and they have a regular war with them, I will withdraw all the British troops and equipment. We don't want two dominions to fight at the very uh, start of their creation. Uh, it will damage both of them. And then Nehru agreed to a ceasefire. They said, leave that area apart, apart alone, and uh, uh, let us try to retain what is here with us. Could you, for somebody who doesn't know Baramulla at all, can you describe what Baramulla was like as a town at that time? What sort of size Baramula of town? Baramulla hasn't very really much changed, you see, except that uh, because of the people's prosperity and all that, new houses have come up, new shopping areas have but, come but, up. But how big is it? Was it, it was that? It was a semi-village. It, it, it was just a town. I don't think the population of uh, Baramulla exceeded 15,000 or 20,000. You see, the biggest town in... Uh, Kashmir after Srinagar was Anantanag, whose, whose uh, population I remember was about 35,000 then. It must be now 2 3 lakhs. It was 35,000. Baramula was a comparatively smaller town, and much of Baramula's prosperity lay because it fell on the route from, uh, you know, Punjab to Kashmir. You know, the buses used to pass from Rabalpindi. 
they would come via Dumail and Udi and Kohuta and all that kind of, also Barambula. So Barambula had lots of these eateries and tuck shops and wayside, you know, where the drivers would halt at night, eat their food and all that kind of thing or get some trade goods. So that was all Barambula's uh, prosperity uh, was about. And I don't think its population was more than 20,000, just an overgrown village, no more than that. Who lived there? Who lived there? The local Kashmiris, both there were Kashmiri Pandits, there were Sikhs, there were a good chunk of Sikhs, a number of Gurdwaras in Baramula, and uh, uh, of course the Muslims, yes. I, I remember approaching Baramula by road from the Uri side, from what, the Pakistan what year, side. What year? The first, oh, just, just recently, the first thing you see in Baramula is a magnificent white Gurdwara, Sikh temple. Ah. So there must be a lot of Sikhs. There are lots of Sikhs. I told you. There are lots of Sikhs there. Uh, Kashmiri, there are even Kashmiri Pandit shrines, these Hindu shrines there. Devis and this thing and that thing. And of course Muslims. Muslims of course naturally are in a majority everywhere. You see the original, uh, it, might be, it might interest you to know, the original name of Baramula, the ancient, in ancient Kashmir history was Varahmul. Varah means uh, a pig, a boar. Uh, there's lots of pigs roaming about. It's a wild place. Varahmul means uh, a place infested by pigs. And Varahmul, over the period of time, got changed or metamorphosed uh, into Varahmula. There was a, a plane passing overhead when you told the story of the Durbar. Could you tell me again from the beginning the story of, of that Durbar you went to? It's the story of? The Durbar when the lights went out. Actually, I do mean the... You see, uh, I could not precisely fix the date, it could be 23rd of October or 24th of October. Uh, that was the day when Dasera, you know, when those effigies are burnt. It's a very important festival and the Dogra prince uh, used to hold uh, a darbar, what is known as darbar, you see, in the local uh, language, uh, kind of an audience, you could call it, uh, where the officers uh, and ministers would come and on a red silk kerchief offer him a sovereign uh, as a kind of a token of their fealty and their allegiance to him. So, this darbar used to be held twice annually, one on Maharaja's birthday and number two on Dasera. Now, Dasera falls in October. So, this Dasera on this particular eventful year, it also fell on, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't be precise about the date, uh, 22nd, 23rd of October and I was also uh, one of the people there inside the hall and the Maharaja was sitting on his throne and uh, you have to advance in a courtier-like manner, uh, very slowly we sort of and, uh, present that sovereign there, he would lift that sovereign, then you would march back a few paces and turn about and go back. So as soon as we did it and at the time we were dispersing, coming out of the hall, the Maharaja left after the darbar was over, the lights went off. So I told a colleague of mine, I said, hello. We are playing to darkness, what has happened? He said, Are bhai, this is obvious, uh, the raiders must have captured. We knew that the raiders were then in, in, in Udi. And everybody was cursing the Maharaja, that look at this callous man, that he is just not bothered about what is happening to this state, and he is just busy collecting these sovereigns and holding this darbar. And the lights went out, after that the lights never came. And the lights went out, why? The lights went out because uh, the, the raiders had captured that uh, the Mohra power station and the staff had run away. <laughs> See, when the whole staff ran away, who would run the who would run the powerhouse? Everybody ran away. Uh, uh, what's it? Uh, it's a, it's a ninety-minute cassette. Uh, Seventy-four minutes. I see. So, that was a sign that the raiders had reached as far as Mohra. Oh yes, oh yes, that was an unmistakable sign. Of course, it was. Yes. Well, what was the Maharaja like? Maharaja was, uh, well, I didn't know him firsthand. And I remember committing a little indiscretion while I was under training as a police officer. Our principal of the training school was a British police officer called H.W. Hare, Harry William Hare. He used to visit our gazetted officer's mess uh, once a week. And one day he told me, hello, call. Uh, do you know the Maharaja well? I said, Sir, I know the Maharaja as much as I know the as I know King Arthur of the legend. 
तो यू नो ही हैड एक्चुअली सेट इन हिज एनिमल रिमार्क्स अबाउट मी दैट दिस ऑफिसर लॉयल्टी टू महाराजा मे मे हैव टू बी चेक टू आई सेट देर इज नो मीटिंग ग्राउंड आई हैव जस्ट सीन हिम एट अ कॉलेज डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन वन डे एट अ डिस्टेंस ऑफ अ फर लॉन्ग नेवर हैड नेवर सा हिम फेस टू फेस ही लिव इन हिज ओन आइवरी ट्रावर ही वॉज Away from the people, I mean, he was not a people's Maharaja. Did he speak Kashmiri? Yes, he had learned Kashmiri, especially the abuses. They say that he was past master in Kashmiri language. Some of abounds in abuses, and he was a past master in that. Well, he had been going to Gulmarg and all that kind of thing, playing polo, and uh, his servants were Kashmiri. Kashmiri Muslims were the the stable boys who looked after his uh, entire pony. Uh, collection and uh, naturally he, he of course he wouldn't be that uh, uh, masterly or uh, about kashmiri but he could talk he could understand he could colloquial kashmiri he knew was uh, karan singh at the durbar karan singh was uh, uh, karan singh was born in 1931 so in 1947 he was just about 16 years old boy was he at the durbar do you remember pardon was he at the durbar that you were at I wouldn't know where he was at that time. Did you see him at all? No, but later on, uh, I know Karan Singh extremely well. You see, he has written a foreword to my book, and uh, Karan Singh later on succeeded as uh, the regent. You see, when the Maharaja was made to sign uh, a kind of a document of abdication by the government of India, then Karan Singh was uh, uh, he was g- given the title of Maharaja of Kashmir, Karan Singh, and. Uh, the maharaja abdicated completely and went to live uh, in the napian sea road he had a bungalow in bombay napian sea road and he went to live in that bungalow that bungalow was subsequently sold by the kashmir government i think for 2 3 crores of rupees looking back on those times hmm. what's your feeling about the impact of that tribal raid do you think this was in a sense where the kashmir crisis that still continues began you see the Kashmiri Muslim at that time had not been indoctrinated with this uh, uh, pan-Islamic, uh, you know, this uh, uh, pan-Islamic mentality, or uh, as the Muslims now all over the world are, you see. So at that time, he was terribly anti-raiders, and uh, as people say that if at that time a plebiscit had been held, uh, it would have gone hundred percent in favor of India, because. Uh, Uh, everybody thought that these raiders are marauders they have come to loot us they have come to destroy us they have come to uh, sort of uh, kill or destroy our way of life and our culture so they were they were terribly against the raiders but subsequently you know with pakistan radio and uh, what have you and the newspapers and others you know this uh, pan islamic propaganda went on and uh, the, over the years the, the the mentality and the thinking changed completely otherwise initially at that time you know the kashmiri youth coming out in the streets of srinagar with hockey sticks and the slogan was uh, uh hamla our khabardar beware o oh raider hum kashmiri hain taiyar we kashmiri are ready for you hamla our it was a rhymed thing hamla our khabardar hamla our means raider one who attacks khabardar beware we hum kashmiri hain taiyar we kashmiri are ready people came out with hockey sticks domestic brooms and other things parading the streets of srinagar uh, sort of in defiance of the raiders these were kashmiri muslim oh yeah, of course kashmiri muslim yes kashmiri muslim uh, with an occasional kashmiri pandit thrown in but uh, the throngs were all muslim oh we used to come and laugh at them we used to go on carry on carry on this is what is required this show this defiance to the raiders and the marauders this is how we will save ourselves Can you say that that slogan is in Urdu or Kashmiri? This is this is actually the uh, this it, it could be either language, but it is actually in Urdu. Can you say it again for me in Urdu? Yes. Hamla our khabar dar, ham Kashmiri hain tayar. Tayar means ready. Ham Kashmiri, we the Kashmiris hain tayar are ready. Hamla our raider attacker, beware, khabar dar. Take note of this fact. You see, khabardar means take note of this fact. Bivya, hamla our khabardar, ham Kashmiri hain tayar. We Kashmiris are ready to fight you and uh, uh, put you in our proper place. Was there any support for the raiders within the Kashmir Valley? No, 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 no. 
you see as i said uh, the people were not prepared for it and in 1947 of course uh, uh, rumblings of pakistan and others were there but this came nobody received them with open arms they were all dreaded people they were all dreaded had there been raiders from the frontier in kashmir before no no raiders no raiders no at least not tribesmen occasional pathans may have been visiting some pathans lived in srinagar i remember there the watchmaker he was a pathan one motor uh, the workshop man was a pathan he was a from front frontier but tribal dar you know they live waziristan uh, beyond where while the al qaeda is now supposed to be spreading spread out from afghanistan that is the area which they inhabited backward people who would kill their opponent or their neighbor just uh, for the heck of it they are backward people they are uh, aborigines in a way half developed and uh, Uh, you know the britishers used to give them a, a good bit of subvention and i remember john gunther saying that uh, they the british used to give a subsidy of so much to this tribal chief in return he behaved i remember the sentence in return he behaved so that the british used to put them in good humor were people frightened of the raiders pardon were people frightened of the raiders frightened oh yes oh yes frightened frightened Yeah, in the beginning, as I said, the marriage, uh, dancing, and uh, singing went on unabated because people didn't know what precisely was happening. But subsequently, when stories trickled in, then they had the the horror of their lives. Yes. What what sort of stories did people hear? Stories that uh, the tribal people have come; they don't spare anybody. They molest women. They loot people. They are out to uh, sort of uh, uh, spread. Uh, turmoil and out to 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 disturb the peace and to uh, see that people uh, uh, don't live that kashmir doesn't remain peaceful things of that sort you see and were these stories true well this to that is why why these people had come all the way you see that's what they were doing uh, in the in the places which they visited you see that's what they were doing so though you see i remember having you know some people uh, engaged these tongas you know horse driven coach they were running away from kashmiri pandit i have seen uh, tonga packed with some bed roll and some utensils thrown in you see rushing towards srinagar hello hello so we would ask them in kashmiri or in urdu what is happening they said they are pursuing they are pursuing they are coming there was, there was panic all around there was panic panic oh yes there was panic people as i told you people from uh, uh, en route you know from baramula to srinagar naturally when they were hearing stories that these people have entered baramula that they have done this they have done that depredation so people were packing up what little they could and rushed towards the srinagar for protection that was happening streams of people coming in you know i have seen those you know the mats on which the kashmiri poor kashmiri would sit in his home rolled up mats and those windows uh, for uh, you know for separating the chaff from the grain things of that sort and packed up in tongas and rushing towards srinagar What happened to all the Europeans who were living in Srinagar? Because there were quite a few, weren't uh, there, at that time? Well, in Srinagar, the raiders never came in. So, uh, we, I, at least I never met any European. Though there was one Mr. Johnson, uh, who used to live there behind the SP College, and uh, there were, of course, a resident was uh, the British resident was there, and the residency and all that. But. Uh, Uh, since the raiders never entered Srinagar, so the question of the Britisher coming into contact with them or being victimized by them wouldn't arise. What sort of place was Srinagar at that time? I mean, because you hear a lot of stories about well, Nedu's hotel. Uh, well, Srinagar was normal. It was, of course, comparatively less noisy, less traffic, more backward than it is now. There were less buildings, less number of shops. And because over the last fifty years, because of uh, there has been a spurt of prosperity there, you see. and uh, new buildings have come up new shops have come up new people education has spread i i know families in srinagar five brothers with five motor cars i've seen that uh, muslim families very well off very prosperous but that those days you know the number of cars for example in 47 in srinagar private cars would not exceed 100 i don't think it would exceed 100 just 100 cars oh, in total but this total. was a capital city oh yeah 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 it was backward poor area yes uh, there were a few aristocrats land owners or maybe some top civil servants who had those morris 8 and all those you know those cars which were well known those days those british models and uh, 
some few and the government servants of course we had those land rovers and jeeps uh, the, the, the government land rovers and jeeps for our movement here and there uh, otherwise i don't think the number of cars in srinagar would exceed 100 in 47 no let me ask you finally you are yourself a kashmiri yes of course you've been forced out of kashmir by yes. the violence how do you feel about it i feel very sad about it very sorry about it. i lost my moorings i i to be very frank I don't just like Delhi because uh, I have been brought up in a provincial town where life was quieter and uh, where I had my friends, where I had grown, where my youth is buried in the stones, cobblestones of Srinagar city. And uh, here in Delhi, I have yet to guess to get roasted. Uh, but we can't, I can't help it. I am terribly sorry about it. I feel terribly nostalgic about it. I would like to go back. Do you think you will go back? I have my doubts, no. no, not in my lifetime, I doubt very much. No Kashmiri Pandit would uh, risk his life there, you see, because recently of this, uh, these killings and all that, you never know. You see, because suppose you are walking on the street and somebody throws a grenade. He throws a grenade at a CRP man, but you are the unlucky man to get hit. That can happen. There is no security, you see. There is no security. And apart from that, as I said, all my colleagues, all my class fellows, all my friends, they all vanished from Srinagar city. What do I go there to do? Who whom do I meet? A new crop of people has come up there. Thank you. Not at I'm, all. I'm just, if I could ask you just to, to be quiet for about 30 seconds.